right, welcome back. Um, we're going to switch our conversation now. And um, the Nigerian Senate on Tuesday, November 5th, uh, we introduced a bill that will regulate the use of social media in the country. The bill is called the Protection from Internet Falsehood and Manipulations Bill 2019. And of course, the sponsor of the legislation is Senator Mohammed Sani Musa. I mean, he says he's trying to curb fake news on the internet, but his action has been greeted, of course, with a lot of controversy. And um, Nigerians are not uh, particularly excited about the prospects of what this might bring. Um, we're going to be talking about this with a cyberspace legal expert, uh, Timi Olagunju. Thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me, Ebuka. Um, so much to, to un un bundle and unravel, but I'll probably just start from, have you read the bill? Or have you seen the bill at least? Well, interestingly, yes. uh, what's it called? The bill was not made available at a particular point in time, but yes. I've had cause to see snippets. Yeah, of I've seen snippets of certain yes, segments or sections of, what, of it on social media. Of plaque, you yes. know. So, uh, but then that's where the challenge too is. Yeah. It, it seems we need to revolutionize the process in which we engage the people. Yeah. And so even the parliament, the Green Chamber itself, proposing this bill, should understand that it can start using social media to publicize bills, to allow for conversation on certain key issues yeah. and prevent um, the rumors uh, yeah. and all that. I mean, so. To play devil's advocate, there's we're now at the public hearings space, uh, segment yes. of, of you know this, yes, this second, bill where yes. people can now have access to it. Um, is it fair to for, for people not to know anything about it until that point, or like you're saying, it should be shared from yeah, once the bill is presented? Exactly. So we need to revolutionise. Now we are in the age of open governance, and so we need to revolutionise governance in such a way that because frankly speaking, parliamentary work is divided into three three categories. First is representation. Second is oversight. Third is lawmaking. But it seems our parliamentarians are more bedeviled with the acts of lawmaking than representation, which is most important as a priority for parliamentarians. Yeah. So in the spirit of representation, it's quite important that parliamentarians understand that in that same spirit, their procedures and processes must align with representation, which is also making their, their activities open early on to the people to avoid specu speculations. Yeah. Yes. Well, you, with what you've seen so far yeah. from the bill, I mean, the snippets and, you know, the, the parts of the bill that you've seen, um, the sort of uproar that Nigerians have sort of greeted this, this bill with, do you think is valid? Do you think it's, it's warranted? Mm -hmm. Are the fears um, sort of warranted from Nigerians? Yes, it is valid. It is valid for certain reasons, uh, because evidence is the end of arguments. And the evidence on ground has shown that um, a lot of social media critics are facing the four walls of prison and all kinds of political and legal molestation in context of they're making their voices heard. So the evidence on ground already shows um, history of gagging social media critics and voices. However, if you look carefully at the bill or snippets from the bill, the bill addresses several other issues. And we must understand that we need to clarify there are two bills out there that we can tag the social media bill in context. The hate speech bill and the other bill, which you talked about, protection from internet falsehood yeah. and misinformation um, mis, uh, um, mis thereabout. Yeah. So the point there is the fact that there are two bills. One proposes death penalty, which is the hate speech bill, not the other bill, which we call the social media bill in context, right? So the other bill itself addresses issues like even redress for people that are perceived offenders. So it addresses issues of redress and avenues for redress. It also addresses issues of mass media uh, institutions, as well as telcos in their dealings with the people but we mustn't also forget that it also puts out punishment for making voices heard on social media. And the evidence already shows that at this point in time, Nigerians are scared. Because even when you look at the bill itself in that context, there are certain provisions of the bill that have been addressed in the Cyber Crimes Act. Certain provisions of the bill addressed in our criminal laws criminal code and penal code. So the context of replicating it in itself 
defeats the very purpose for which laws should be made, which is the fact that laws should look forward to dealing with key issues of priority. And so, for example, take key issues of priority before this house. You know, one thing Nigerians do not know is, and which we need to clarify, is that when a particular house leaves and then there's a new parliament, the whole bills that have not become law dies in natural death, and you need to introduce them into the house. And so there are certain key bills that we need to look at from the last term assembly. Bills around the Corporate Affairs Commission, bills around Kama. How can we ensure that Nigerian businesses, the tech space, the online business community can be well captured in their intention and in their business, in the Companies and Allies Matters Act? These are key issues we need to look at. How can we ensure that the Freedom of Information Bill um, 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 Act itself becomes a thing domesticated at the state level? So, in economics, we talk of scale of preference. And one of the key scale of preference should be key things that will drive us forward and not things that will make Nigerians apprehensive considering the evidence before it. But on the other side, there's a lot of people who believe that. I mean, this is one, probably one of the most divisive times in our nation, both politically, you know, along tribal and religious lines even. Every comment seems to be either taken out of context or, you know, met with a lot of just bile and just people are desperate and angry from all corners. And the argument is traditional media is regulated, isn't it? And social media has become this alternative for a lot of people. And around the world is an ongoing conversation of what needs to be done. Is it wrong for this to be done? Fantastic question. Now, when we look at, we need to distinguish the facts here. Traditional media run by institutions. Social media seems like banters of humans. And the saying goes that with great speech or freedom of speech also comes great foolish foolishness. And so the point there remains that yes, because traditional media itself is run by institutions, social media is largely not an institutional thing, but more of a people thing. And so in that context, one of the things we need to look at as a nation is to begin to look at how to deal with the providers in context. For example, you see all that Facebook is going through in the US. And so you deal with the providers to ensure that they make technology available that are able to deal with these issues and not try to gag people's voices from being heard. And so if you are to deal with the traditional media, you see that the laws regulate the institutions Channels TV, name them, right? Now, when you deal with social media, why doesn't the law also deal with the institutions that provide platforms rather than the people's voices that should be heard? And so the truth about it is in law, as a lawyer, you know, you understand that there's this saying about defining what the law is, and then you have a horse, six blind men or seven blind men, Different persons touch the horse. And then everybody defines the horse according to what it perceives the horse to be. And so the point there is that with freedom of speech increases understanding because conversation enriches the understanding. And so we reduce the level of our blindness when we allow people to air their views in context of being able to share what they can think is, is, is in, within the purview. And look, there are laws that cater for issues of slander, libel, and even the Cyber Crimes Act. However, as a solution, we need to start looking at a 3C approach. And this is to the parliament itself. Consultation, consolidation, and confrontation. We seem, the parliament seems to focus, or policymakers seem to focus much more on the confrontational approach to dealing with lawmaking. We need to come back to the drawing board and apply the consultative approach. Get people within the space together. Have conversation with them on how best to address these key issues. And then you consolidate on them before you then confront the issue. And so these are key issues we need to look at carefully. I, I, I keep having 
trying to remember a lot of instances. I mean, there were so many times during the elections even when images will be splattered all over social media. Oh, so so and so is happening in this place. And people will get agitated. And I mean, we've seen reprisal attacks. We saw what happened with the xenophobic attacks in South Africa. Yeah. Yes, xenophobia is a problem in South Africa. Yeah. But the one that happened, I think it was in August or mm. September of this year, where we saw bodies being burnt and Nigerians were upset and it snowballed into this mess that we had in Nigeria where companies were attacked and some people were beaten up and shops were completely vandalized, even Nigerian-owned shops. Mm. We found out later no, but no Nigerian was killed. The, the videos we saw were videos from five, six, seven, eight months ago of not even Nigerians. You know, I understand your point about, you know, institutions being held responsible, but to what extent do we start, how do we control things like that? I mean, mm. I wake up today, I, I put out a video and say, oh, I was shot yesterday. But nothing happened. People are going to believe it. I'm a human being. I'm not an institution. How do we stop things like that if we don't have a bill like this? That's a good question. You see, if the foundation be destroyed, the ladies know better. What can the makeup artist do? Right? And so the makeup <laughs> artist can only put powder. Right? And so the foundation, clearly, should be dealing with issues of not just technicality and legality, but issues of orientation. How much is the National Orientation Agency, how much is the Ministry of Communication, Information, doing to get partners together to get people to understand the length and the breadth of the activities? How much are we doing to teach our children in primary school, ethics, and the importance of the responsibility of one person to another person. These are key fundamental issues that if we address, firstly, from an orientation point of view, we might have been able to solve a large part of the problem. But to now fast track the process such that we leave primary one and move into PhD by applying punitive measures on an issue that has already been dealt with by certain provisions of our laws copiously is itself to defeat the very purpose of lawmaking and to turn the law into a whip on the people rather than a friend for the people. Yeah. And so these are key issues that... So the first thing I think we need to do is to invest massively in the education and re-education of the people on the context and importance of their duty as a voice to society. Because you see, everything has an opportunity cost. And so the opportunity cost of guarding people's voices is larger than the opportunity cost of allowing their voices heard. We did see, sorry, sorry to cut you there. I mean, I think it was Enough is Enough Nigeria, the organization yeah. that's, you know, that's a pressure group. Um, they did put out uh, snippets of the, of the bill and how it was sort of word for word copied from Singapore, <laughs> uh, a, bill, uh, a law that's, that it also exists there. Yeah. Um, yesterday we did hear the first lady um, uh, say something along the lines of why can Nigeria not attempt to control um, 180 people? After all, it's been done in China, which should replicate what's happened in China. Mm -hmm. People would say, oh, look at China, look at Singapore. These are countries that are doing amazingly well. And um, they might not necessarily be full democracies, but we can see the results of the sort of governance that it has, what it has on the people. Singapore is a first world country, happened in a generation. China is the second biggest economy in the world, so they're probably going to be the first in a few years. Are those not sort of places we need to copy? Maybe, you don't think? So we need to distinguish here. This is Nigeria, right? Singapore, let's start with China. China is a communist society. Nigeria is a democracy. That itself, the fact speaks for itself, firstly. So the similitude of copying itself does not work. Now, Singapore, frankly speaking, fact check, that bill is a direct replica with some amendments here and there of the Singaporean Act. But the Singaporean Act itself was implemented passed into law in 2019, May, thereabout, 2019. And the first implementation of that law itself was just nine days ago. And so there, is, there are still debates. 
In fact, in world ranking, Singapore ranks low. I think 150-something of 160-something, thereabout, ranks really low in terms of press freedom. And so in terms of, is that the kind of replica that we want to have? So in terms of implementation, right, it goes to show that there are still debates in Singapore as to whether the emergence of that law itself will be in itself good or bad to the people in terms of implementation. And so why not wait for the evidences of Singapore? And then we can then now use the evidences of Singapore before we now replicate same bill. We replicated the bill immediately it was passed as a law there. We did not even wait for the implementation and the other reprisal effect to see what works and what doesn't work. Madness is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. We cannot have copied something, having not seen what, what works and what doesn't work, and then think it will definitely work in Nigeria. No, that is it. Now, some persons have also said that countries like uh, Germany and countries like, um, you know, uh, in, in Rwanda, had the issues they had because of the fact that people spread false information. But let the facts be clear. Conscience is an open wound, only truth can heal. The truth there is that it was political people in power that spread misinformation to change and, 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 and gauge the mind of the people away from what was right. If they had social media in Rwanda, and Germany in those days, and people could give a counter narrative, then trust me, what had happened might not have happened. And so that is why I said earlier that the opportunity costs in terms of guarding people's voices is higher than the opportunity cost in terms of allowing them to have free speech. Are you worried? Are you worried that this bill will be passed? Are you worried that of what the effects might be? Well, particularly speaking, I am a lawyer. And as a cyberspace lawyer and policy consultant, one of the key things I look for is what happens at the end. I doubt this law will ever pass because I know that the Nigerian people, the civil society groups, will not close their eyes to participating actively. And look, the idea of parliamentary work is representation. So I ask Senator Musa, who is proposing or who had put this bill before the House, is that what his people at his constituency in Niger East told him to go and present before the House on their behalf? Is that a burning priority to them? And so this idea of parliamentarians coming with their own ideals of what society should be as against representing what the people's aspirations should be, needs to change. And so that is a message to the Green Chambers on this regard and to the Nigerian people that your parliamentarians represent you and whatever bill in the house should be bills that represent you, not bills that represent their interests. That's the first thing. Second thing is, as regards the question you raised as, as to whether it will pass or not, Look, if it passes, we will challenge it in court for constitutional issues that it had failed to meet and standard based on the exclusive legislative list. But those are issues for on another day. But I trust the Nigerian people that we will not allow our voices. Look, if they are consulted properly on this issue, conversation enriches the understanding. Trust me, we would have had a better bill. And some of the good sides of that bill would have sufficed more than this one. Okay, we're going to go on a break now. Um, pretty heavy topic there, but when we come back, we'll be talking about some other issues affecting us as a nation. Traffic, transportation. Don't go All right, welcome back. Before the break, we are talking about the social media bill, and I just wanted to point out that uh, we did reach out to Senator Sani Musa to get a reaction. He is a sponsor. Uh, of the bill, in, and we did reach out to him for a reaction, but unfortunately we didn't get any response. So hopefully uh, we can do that in, in a future 
uh, programs. But um, there's so much to talk about, and I want to talk about Lagos now. I know this is yeah. not such a national issue, but I mean, Lagos mm. is the nerve, economic nerve center of the country. Yes. So what affects Lagos, I believe, affects the nation. And the last couple of weeks have been really, really hellish. Um, I know people who were on the road, I believe it was last Thursday or the Thursday before that one, uh, who were out on the roads till about 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Mm. around, you know, the Ozumba axis and not knowing what the problem was. People were stuck at a spot for an hour, two hours. I don't know. What do we, th what do we hear is going on? Because th there's talks about oh, all the roads have been fixed at the same time, but I still see bad roads everywhere, so I'm not sure exactly what's happening. Mm. Uh, well, well it's, 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 the concern is it's a huge one, you know, because uh, it depletes on the productivity level of Lagos. And Lagos is not the walls and the buildings. Lagos is you and I. Nigeria is you and I. So it depletes, it reduces productivity. And trust me, if researchers do a quantitative analysis of the economic um, uh, quantification of what is being lost in terms of productivity, it will be massively huge. And I, I think the challenge is a lack of innovation. And innovation starts from consultation, right? We need a more data-driven approach to governance. For example, you know, nothing stops um, the Lagos state government from applying a more scientific approach to this issue. Take a random data of a month of where the holdups are, you know, are much more more prominent and do put certain gadgets in people's cars and take sensors use some some sensor sensor scientific approach towards getting data you might discover that some of these holdups are cost for example if you remember the officer's mess when you drive through officer's mess there's a small small road there with a large pothole that seems bigger than the road that itself, if fixed, can ease off traffic in the context of people not having to stop. So we need a more data-centric approach to driving the issue of dealing with traffic in Lagos states, or else we will keep having the same problem. Interestingly, this issue is not even just a Lagos issue, because I know I do have family. I mean, I'm from Anambra state, and of course, we I go back quite often. I have family who visited the East, I think, two or three weeks ago who spent, I don't know, it must have been about six, seven hours. I started hearing about, you know, talks about from Moni Chatsuasaba, which is literally a 30 second to a one minute drive crossing, a, crossing the River Niger Bridge. I heard of cadres were charging as much as 7,000 Naira for Moni mm. Chatsuasaba, just, just to take people across the bridge because of how bad the traffic has been. You know, we're hearing talks of this uh, along the Kaduna, Abuja, there's just so much. Is it a breakdown of infrastructure? Is that the only reason why this is happening, you think? Well, aside the, aside, you see, aside the breakdown of infrastructure, like I said earlier, it's an evidence. We need an evidence-driven approach to policymaking. And that is where we are lacking. For example, if you look at the past, if we had an evidence-driven approach to policymaking, you will discover that the issue of electricity, an issue of congestion, would have been properly dealt with. The issue of housing would have been dealt with because the governance structure would have done policies, would have envisaged certain things that would have happened in terms of population increase. For example, it's surprising that Nigeria has not taken any reasonable data in the past 10 years in terms of census. It's surprising that the projection of population increase, that we're going to be much more than the population of the United States by 2050, is coming from the United States state population um, uh, fund, thereabout, and not even Nigeria. And so these are key issues. I feel that if we deal with the way we deal with policy and do what we call evidence-driven policy making, we might be able to achieve more in terms of understanding what the core issues are. For example, that same road, do we have an office that tells us the data of the inflow and outflow of people on certain times? For example, we use a lot of common sense, and common sense is not common in sense. For example, in December, common sense, not even data, will tell you that there will be an influx of people along that bridge who are most likely traveling home to family. And so if we have all this kind of evidence-driven data, it helps policymakers to be able to structure policies 
that helps to deal with these issues. So for example, rather than allow the Okada riders take advantage of poor Nigerian people, because for some people, they think they are not poor. God forbid, a major illness happens. That's when they know how vulnerable they are in terms of how much they have. And so, provide certain measures to deal with this issue. So we need a more, and I propose, this is the proposal. I propose for Lagos State, because Lagos State is key in terms of traffic. I propose a data-driven traffic office, and a, an office of evidence-based policy that looks at key issues, not just by assumption. And you see, Lagos State has the Bureau of Statistics. Lagos State has its own, as as the National Bureau of Statistics. But that office itself seems to be bedeviled with a lot of issues, including economic and social political issues, that it might not be able, as an office, to deal with the nitty gritty scientific nature of evidence that we need to deal with data. Again, evidence. I heard the governor of Lagos State. He seems to want to do so much. But I think one thing he needs to apply is more of a listening approach to governance. And so I, he talked about the fact that Lagos State roads, you know, we're in the rainy season, it's difficult to get roads done in the rainy season. Who says that Lagos State cannot start leading innovatively? in the process of looking for alternative ways to doing roads. For example, in certain countries in Asia, are you aware that certain uh, plastic, um, recycled plastic uh, stuff are used to produce certain road layers for the roads? So is there a research office that is looking for an alternative approach to getting roads done using recyclable materials, considering how dirty Lagos or even Anambra or any other state is. You know, so those are key issues we need to start looking at. We need evidence-driven approach to policy making, not just building roads and all that in, in context, as it were. Well, thank you very much. I know we are all very worried because, I mean, December is usually the peak of traffic and this is December the 1st. And if November was that crazy, I don't know what uh, this month will bring, but... Hopefully, fingers crossed, we all survive it as we always do. They say Nigerians are very resilient. But I don't yes. know if resilience is sort of trade that we want to be having in these times, you know. Yes. Thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. Well, like I always say, you can follow the conversation on Twitter at Robin Minds now is the handle. You can also use the hashtag Robin Minds when tweeting at us. Have a good day, and I'll see you next time. We represent.